Omnitrax is a Colorado-based short-line rail operator and logistics provider. Recently, they suffered a ransomware attack that seriously disrupted operations and caused material business impacts. Ransomware is an indiscriminate menace to anyone who uses information technology. Attackers gain access to systems and render files inaccessible to the users. And recently, attackers have begun leaking files on so-called leak sites to further encourage victims to pay up. In this show, special guests Mike and Ellie discuss ransomware, how it's affecting business operations, and what the future holds. Mike Wiegand is a Shift5 founder and currently its president and chief growth officer. He's a former Army cyber officer, computer nerd, InfoSec and drone enthusiast turned entrepreneur who loves all things control systems within heavy vehicles. Ellie Daw is a product lead of anomaly detection and data science at Shift5. Her focus is aligning analysis with scalability and impact for customer data sets. She comes from a background in applied cryptography, secure protocol design, and industry research for emerging technologies such as quantum and private computation. Mike, Ellie, welcome to the show. Yeah, Josh, yeah, thanks for having us. So some big news happened recently. Uh, Omnitrax, which is a short line rail operator, uh, got hacked. So I guess let's start off, Mike, with just explaining who Omnitrax is and what short line operators do. Yeah, so first to a short line operator. So uh, within the rail industry, uh, we, we kind of separate out the, the major railroads, the players into the big boys, the class one freight railroads, uh, plus Amtrak, because they are uh, you know, kind of a across the nation uh, commuter and a passenger railroad service. But these are the, the railroads that we're you know, all accustomed to hearing about, Union Pacific, BNSF, CSX, et cetera. Um, then on the other end of the spectrum are short line operators. These are small regional railroads. Uh, they may or may not own their own track. They're gonna do operations like switching, you know, combining cars and, and making uh, train consists and uh, do, doing local distribution. Um, they might uh, have their own hauling operations, but uh, they're typically, you know, going to be smaller companies. Uh, absolutely vital to uh, the the distribution network and transportation logistics system across the country. Um, but uh, you know, I think uh, in a unique position in terms of uh, their scale and uh, in the types of assets that they use. Gotcha. And um, so Omnitrack itself is one of the largest privately owned railroads in the U.S. Uh, and it's one of these short line rail operators. So, you know, they're operating locomotives. They got pretty sig significant IT infrastructure. Uh, Ellie, give me a sense of what exactly happened in this attack. Yeah. So there were two kind of main components. One was the actual ransomware and then one was like data theft. They're, they're kind of related. So ransomware, of course, is when kind of your system is encrypted and the data is held hostage, right? So anything that's like, I don't know, files or like just anything on your system is kind of inaccessible to you. And these adversaries will hold it ransom. They will say, if you pay us, you know, X, Y, Z number of Bitcoins, we will unlock it for you. Um, the, the data theft portion is kind of interesting. As you mentioned at the beginning, instead of like just holding things hostage, some adversaries instead are like posting maybe embarrassing data or, or like private data or things that we don't want released um, publicly if they're not getting paid. So those are kind of the, the two sides of what happened. Wow. Yeah. So the whole point here is that the the attacker or the the threat actor is just trying to make a buck, right? Um, and so they're first off trying to render important files inaccessible, but then they're releasing them on the internet. That almost seems counterintuitive. If they're trying to make it inaccessible, why would they also post some of them online? Yeah, I think it's it's kind of two different sides of the same coin. Like in one way they want the actual company to be affected and like have a reason to want to pay the money. Um, but also say like you have a deadline to pay this money. And if you don't pay it, then instead we're going to embarrass you and hurt your business that way. So it's kind of the end goal is to make the money. Yeah. But also to kind of hurt the business and if they're not going to pay up. Yeah. That's really clever and also kind of uh, super depressing that that's people are doing this to each other. Right. Um, so, uh, Mike, we talked a little bit about how Omnitrax has OT infrastructure, operational technology, things like the rolling stock, 
um, the switching infrastructure on on the um, on the on the rail, but they've also got IT infrastructure. So all the employees are using things like cell phones, laptops, network gear, so that they can organize information. Um, give me a sense of what sorts of systems do we think the OmniTrack ransomware attacked, and then what was the what was the result of the of of the the ransomware hitting th that those parts of the infrastructure. Yeah, so obviously, uh, you know, complete conjecture uh, on my part. Haven't had any conversation with them. Um, would love to if we could be of assistance. <laughs> uh, so, you know, typically I think groups like this, uh, you know, going after these double extortion kind of ransomware uh, attacks using that playbook, uh, there seems to be a, a common thread where they're exploiting different methods to get access to a domain controller and then use that to uh, lock up, you know, core components of an IT or corporate network. Um, you know, many uh, railroads that we've talked to go to pains um, to attempt to separate their operational and uh, in corporate networks. However, by its very nature, there are many seams between the two. Um, the corporate networks, of course, are, are you know, uh, connected to the internet, uh, just as all of, they, all of them are, because you know, the primary uh, purpose of them is going to be communication, email, um, you know, both within and, and without the organization. So uh, if, if I were a guessing man, um, I would say <laughs> I think that uh, you know, they probably leveraged uh, some of the techniques that we continue to be uh, you know, seen as successful, um, sending a, a spear phishing email to somebody that had uh, credentials, uh, you know, gaining local access to a machine, uh, you know, pivoting uh, through the network, increasing privilege, and then getting access uh, to, to core networking components that give them the reach um, to go after multiple endpoints or data stores, um, you know, siphon that off, encrypt it in place, and then, uh, and then ransom them. Yeah, so Ellie, I know this is pretty basic cryptography and you're like at the forefront of the field, but maybe you could break this down for us a little bit. So you've got a file, a pretty big file maybe on on a on a computer, uh, the target's computer, and you're the attacker and you want to crypto locker that file. What does that generally look like? And, and how is that a reversible process so that if you pay the ransom, I'm going to be able to quote unquote unlock the file for you? Yeah, so it's interesting because ransomware usually uses both symmetric and asymmetric crypto. So just like a quick, like, quick, quick um, explanation of those. Symmetric is where you encrypt and decrypt with the same key. So this is typically like pretty fast and performant. Um, but then you have the problem of like, you have to kind of securely share the key so that the person encrypting can give it kind of safely to the person who needs to decrypt. Um, asymmetric crypto is where you can encrypt and decrypt with different keys. So this solves the like needing to share a key securely problem. So how these are both used in ransomware usually is there's a symmetric key that's used to encrypt the file system. Um, I Symmetric crypto is like a little bit faster, so it's easier to, to use symmetric crypto to do this. Yeah, like and, some of the modern processors even have like hardware acceleration for, for like AES or like the, the most recent standard symmetric, right? Yeah, exactly. Like just as performant as we have in the industry pretty much. So they can do this very quickly, making it a little bit more difficult to stop. But then that symmetric key is encrypted with one of the asymmetric keys. So it's encrypted with the public key. In asymmetric key pairs, there's public and private. So symmetric key used to encrypt the file system and then it's encrypted with the public key and then the ransomware victim is given like the text of the encrypted symmetric key and has to hand that over with the money basically to the adversary and the adversary will use their private key to decrypt the symmetric key and give the kind of decrypted key back to the victim so that they can use it to to decrypt their file system so it's kind of multi-step, but uses a couple of different crypto primitives, which is cool. Yeah. I mean, and the whole idea is that it's basically impossible to recover that original key, right? Because it never traversed the, the network. So if you have like packet capture of things that are going across the wire, you're not able to like pull that symmetric key out and then reverse the operation. And the, um, the public key 
it doesn't help you to know what that is really, right? So it's it's actually a pretty clever use of of some cryptographic primitives to achieve achieve the goal. So this is an example of like. An, a, one kind of attack that an attacker could launch. It's really just a payload though on the tip of, I think Mike, like you were getting into what is a longer campaign to actually get code running on some of these, um, on some of these machines, right? So um, I wanted to dig into a couple of things that you mentioned, Mike, you know, we talked about phishing as an example. Um, there are a whole bunch of ways you, you can get on uh, onto computers. If there was this, for example, um, uh, there were a couple of exploits that uh, that got dumped on the internet a few years ago for uh, zero days for for Windows machines um, that was attri commonly attributed to the U.S. intelligence community. Uh, somebody, uh, an enterprising uh, uh, hacker, hacked that zero day onto a, a crypto locker, and we ended up with a whole family of, uh, of of crypto malware that were just like worming from one computer to the next, right? Can you give me a sense of some of the other ways that you've heard of or seen attackers getting access onto, uh, onto computers to do things like crypto locker? Yeah. So, you know, the traditional means have been to come through network access, right? Uh, as uh, as computers and software uh, you know have been progressively hardened over the years, tons of investment has been put into that over the last two decades, and we see that now paying off with uh, you know really quite secure operating systems and modern OSs are are uh, just you know uh, completely um, you know, unfathomably you know secure compared to where they were you know ten or, or fifteen years ago. Um, we see that uh, that there are still um, you know issues and challenges though. So uh, the two most common ways um, that I notice are that uh, attackers are leveraging uh, people's trust and they're getting the user to take certain actions in order to take authorized uh, actions on their computer that then allow an adversary to you know pivot or or get some kind of malware or code running on their local machine. And then through that, they can escalate privileges, you know, locally gain some type of persistence so that they can stay there without, you know, any type of user interaction and then do things so essentially kind of enabling, you know, a remote control or maybe some automated uh, means to, uh, to traverse the network and then continue, you know, replicating and, and moving on a worm concept, you know, perfectly explained there. Um, what I have found really interesting is how uh, attackers have uh, recognized that, you know, the bar has been set so high in the IT industry. Uh, that they've searched for these other, you know, kind of non-traditional means to get onboard systems. Um, that is, you know, using uh, different types of authorized activities um, and pivoting through different means or mechanisms uh, that are generally just not considered within the purview of the IT security, uh, you know, within a, a company. So a perfect example of this, um, you know, would be maintenance activities that are being conducted on vehicles, for example. Um, you know, routinely uh, different types of computers, whether they're little handheld scanners, whether they look like laptops or not, there are different types of, you know, embedded computers and controllers that are hooked up to these devices all the time. And uh, they're used to pull fault codes and interrogate and interact with these machines. Some of them have the ability to update onboard code. Uh, that's a really attractive way for an attacker to pivot, you know, from say an internet location or an external location, or perhaps even through the supply chain, um, into an intermediary device that then interacts with something kind of on the back end, if you will, doing an end run around all of the security. Um, you know, I guess if if you you know like to think like, uh, you know, in a physical way, it's almost like what the Germans did, you know, in World War II, where they went around the Maginot Line, right? They saw all these defenses and they were like, that looks really tough. Let's not just run right into that buzzsaw. For, you yeah. know, the side door sounds just fine. Thank you. The yeah. side door is fantastic. And, yeah. uh, you know, it makes, um, it, it, and so unfortunately, the side door is often left open and, and many people are unaware that there are so many side doors right. that exist in the first place. Yeah, we had um, the the Phylum guys, Aaron Bray and uh, Pete Morgan on to talk about solar winds, which was just like, you're like, oh my gosh, how do you even defend against this? It's supply chain attacks, you know, um, or or um, software dependencies that might have been backdoored. Ellie, have you seen any, any examples of where attackers have used these kinds of techniques of, you know, backdooring things? Uh, to gain execution on on computers? I think, I, I guess as Mike was talking, I was just thinking about how like, it's easy to think like, oh, I have the most advanced firewall, so I'm safe. 
but like we can't forget about social engineering or we can't for like you it's kind of a big like multifaceted thing and so I think I think like the short answer to, to your question is yes I think it's it's more common than not that the side door is used because it's hard. It's really hard to go in the front door if the front door is locked, right? I guess one of the things I'm thinking about at the top of my head is like, I was thinking back to Black Hat and some of the, the remote code execution attacks on vehicles. So there was one like on Jeep and one on Tesla. It, it's hard to find an easy way in, right? And so usually it's like, okay, I got into this like low hanging fruit thing and it's not obvious how this connects to the underlying like CAN network in the car so that I can control like actually the brakes and the like important steering things, you know, but they find a way like it, you're, you're able to kind of pivot between these systems, but a lot of times you have to kind of access the like easier, maybe neglected thing that doesn't seem like it's a threat before you can get to the thing that actually like is the crown jewels, right? Yeah, I, I, and we had a, a recent episode with Rob Peasley and Brian where we talked about uh, reverse engineering and vulnerability research where sometimes Rob would take a look at a device and say, wow, this is pretty hard and like, I don't think this is the right way to go. And then he looks at the next thing in the chain. He's like, oh, this is way easier. I'm just going to go this way and then pivot onto the thing that I'm actually interested in, right? Yeah, it, it reminds me too, like even down to kind of the technical nitty gritty, like you, it's it's not enough to kind of protect the edges if you didn't do software fuzzing, which might allow like, I don't know, buffer overflow, right? Like this is something that like someone has to be kind of in the system to execute this. And so you feel like, okay, I've got the edges, like we're covered. But if, if you didn't kind of do the insides too, then there are more things that they can grab hold of or like more ways they might be able to pivot or different code they can run. De right. Defense in depth, right? Defense yeah, in depth. Defense in depth. I mean, two things come to mind. I just want to, you know, add on. This is such a, such a simple concept, um, but when it's applied, it's very difficult to apply it or at least to, you know, to, to hold, I think, uh, everybody to a standard, you're only as strong as like as your weakest link. And so there are all these trust relationships between different types of, uh, of interacting systems in any type of network. Um, you know, you, you really where you need to focus your attention is on the insignificant, you know, the seemingly insignificant stuff on the edges, because that's typically where the least resources are, are implemented. Um, and then, uh, you know, just a as a as a former army guy right josh you know something that we both learned in infantry school was that you know an obstacle um you know that you that you in place without some type of overwatch is useless yep. uh the, you it know, just the, slows people down right right it, you know they're going to have all day long to to get around it and so uh you know i fundamentally believe that um, you can have the best security in the entire world but if nobody's watching it if nobody's prepared to do something about it if there aren't trained you know, responsive actions that are ready to be taken, um, then, uh, you know, you're, it's just a matter of time. You know, so it's like you have to monitor, time. right? You have to like almost at some level do your best to stop a compromise, but then you have to, okay, cool. Given that we somehow got compromised, now let's assume we've got an actor in the wire. Let's try to make the amount of time between them breaching and us discovering it and remediating it as short as possible. I mean, I read this really depressing statistic. It was like took on average nine months for, for enterprises to find out that they've been breached. I mean, think about nine months, what kind of damage someone can do or how extensively they could have penetrated a network. It's really, really upsetting, you know? And I think what was interesting, uh, at least to, to, to our team about Omnitrax um, was that it affected operations. Like this isn't just, hey, my photos or my documents got lost or like I have some embarrassing, you know, stuff that got leaked out on the internet. Like business operations were halted. Like as far as we're aware, you know, Omnitrax had a difficult time like conducting its business operations as a result of all of its infrastructure going down. And um, Ellie, this isn't the first time this has happened where you've got a company whose IT infrastructure got hit with ransomware and then they were unable to conduct operations. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the history here? I mean, it's been a couple of years. There's been a number of attacks. Yeah, I think there are even some really interesting ones just from 2020, which I think like 2020 is just its own kind of <laughs> cyber like landscape, right? Because everyone was at home and it's like a different beast. I think a lot of challenges popped up that we all had to kind of tackle. Um, but in 2020, there was the first 
loss of life um, at a hospital due to ransomware in Germany. Um, systems were were taken hostage. They, you know, they were hit by ransomware, and a woman was having a life-threatening emergency and had to be kind of rerouted to a different hospital. But the delay caused her to like not, you know, she didn't get the care she needed in the time she needed to. Um, which I think we've known ransomware has been an issue, but this was kind of the first time that it was like, okay, there was a loss of human life. Like this is a different thing, you know, this isn't this isn't like files on a machine, this is a, a human being. And we need to kind of think about how we want to tackle this. So that was a big one. That was September 2020. Um, I know also there was um, Baltimore had a ransomware attack on their like remote learning system. And they had to kind of shut down remote learning for kids for a few days while they were recovering from that. Um, another one also in Baltimore was a system that's used by, um, I think it was within the government, but, but it's kind of used to issue the liens um, during house closings, right? So when someone's buying a house, they have to kind of get together yeah, all, all, the of, all of their stuff. paperwork. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it might be titles, not liens. I may use the misspoke there, but yeah, so so when that system was was kind of held ransom, people couldn't close on their houses. <laughs> like this this was nothing to do with them. It was nothing to do even with the like process of buying a house. It just was kind of the logistics behind the scenes. Right. It's like Mark Andreessen said like software is eating the world, right? But it's like also making everything vulnerable to cyber attack because everything depends on software, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's things that you don't think about needing to be dependent on on computer systems. Another big one was NotPetya hit a like port authority. Oh yeah, is, this is absolutely one of my yeah. favorites to study the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Just bananas. Like I think it was saying something like 10 to 20,000 ships going in and out a day, like every single day. And they didn't have a like digital way to manage that while their systems were down. It's yeah, so a little bit of background on this. First, uh, some source material. Um, Wired Magazine ran an article on the NotPetya attack against Maersk. Uh, I think it was a year, year and a half ago. It is absolutely, I think, one of the best write-ups on any type of malware and the operational and business impacts that were propagated globally uh, that I've ever read. So I would encourage all the listeners to, uh, to you know, Wired uh, Magazine, Maersk, uh, NotPetya, N-O-T-P-E-T-Y-A. So uh, I think that the, the business impacts that, that Maersk um, had to recover from are, are really the notable thing. You know, just holding the technology and the ransomware uh, and the, the history and all that kind of to the side for a second, Maersk's entire global domain controller infrastructure was taken over by an automated worm that crypto locked everything. Um, it propagated through their entire network within a couple hours. And it had the result, as you were describing, Ellie, of really stopping port operations at uh, more than a dozen of their major ports. Uh, the closest one, I think, to us here in in uh, in um, the Baltimore? capital region was, I think it was actually up in New Jersey, the port oh, of New Jersey, okay. Okay. which I think is the largest on the East Coast. That one was completely shut down. That's Operational amazing. impact, trucks were backed up down Interstate 95 because they couldn't process the trucks with the containers into the port because um, you know, there are sensors that read the containers and there's a, a way in, in a gate station to let the trucks in. The New Jersey State Police had to like clear this I-95 backup and basically tell everybody to get lost because uh, the port was closed. Um, you know, so here's an example of you know, a company being targeted, their IT infrastructure going down, it fundamentally affecting their operations and that having a massive ripple effect on global logistics. I mean, that's, we will never know, you know, what the actual cost of that cyber attack is uh, beyond, you know, what, what Merce calculated. I'm sure they, um, you know, are, are probably not going to share that, but it, it must've been huge. Uh, so, you know, the operational and business impacts of some of these cyber attacks is, is just devastating. Yeah, yeah. It really can be wild. Yeah, and and what's remarkable to me is, you know, typically we've talked about this a couple of times on the show, but uh, you have information technology is all about making good business decisions, organizing and sorting information, and then operational technology, something that we at Shift Five deal with all the time, is stuff that is done to conduct business operations. But we're seeing examples of where attacks against IT infrastructure 
are causing massive ripple effects on the operations side, right? But, uh, you know, Mike, uh, you and I have had experience in the DOD doing a lot of cybersecurity weapon system uh, assessments. And there's a GAO report out there from 2018 that talks all about this, where it's not just attacks against IT infrastructure we need to be worried about. We also need to be very concerned about attacks against the OT infrastructure itself, right? Ellie, can you give me a sense of just how digitized some of these assets like a locomotive or, you know, in Maersk's case, a maritime shipping vessel are these days? Yeah, I think so. So most of these, um, most of these systems are kind of running on their own like network of things, right? So in locomotives or like a lot of vehicles, they use CAN, um, CAN bus to kind of communicate between all of the different electronic components. Um, but as we alluded to earlier, the, the CAN bus is not necessarily like air gapped from everything else. And so if you have a component that is talking to the network in some other way, then this opens an attack vector. Um, that's not to say that like air gap networks are, are just secure because they're air gap. That's not <laughs> necessarily the case either. Um, Defense but, in depth, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I think like a lot, a lot of kind of operational systems like this have their own like style of network and their own like maybe specific attack that might be relevant to their like protocols that they use or whatever. But that's not to say that they're not like vulnerable from other styles of attacks too. Be like as things are kind of introduced to different networks and more connectivity is added. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And Mike, give us a sense of a couple of the things that you've seen out in the wild where electronic units that are part of OT have like real cyber vulnerabilities on them. And, you know, as a follow on, how secure are these things? Yeah, so just fundamentally embedded electronics that constitute the control systems. And usually there are going to be multiple subsystems within a large complex vehicle like a locomotive or like an airliner um, that are all working together to form a master system and, and make the thing do what it needs to do. Um, fundamentally, those embedded electronic computers and line replaceable units, um, they are designed to be extremely reliable. They are coded and, and physically built, um, you know, to be robust, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to have high uptime. Um, often they are never designed uh, with security in mind because the initial design premise was that they would, um, you know, be isolated or air gapped. Uh, so they use, uh, in general, older technology. Um, I have not come across uh, any line replaceable units or embedded controllers in the locomotive industry, for example, that use trusted platform modules that encrypt data at rest, for example, um, you know, that... Uh, uh, you know, where uh, the code base has gone through some type of formal analysis or has been stigged, that's a DOD term, you know, some, uh, on the, uh, some of our listeners might cringe hearing, but, you know, it, it does apply a good set of, uh, you know, cybersecurity uh, uh, control measures, you know, to the operating environment or the application. So, you know, in, in general, I think that we find that the people that build uh, large complex mechanical systems are concerned first, first and foremost, and rightly so, with just making the thing do and be controlled in the right way to accomplish its actual mission. And only in the last couple of years have people realized, hey, wait a second, we need to start thinking about these cybersecurity uh, issues as requirements and build them in from the beginning. The challenge is, Josh, we have trillions of dollars worth of equipment, operational technology that's in use across nearly every you know, commercial uh, industry and government uh, you know, vertical or segment how do we protect all of that stuff? And uh, especially when, uh, Ellie, you mentioned a CAN bus, um, there's no encryption on it. Uh, you know, authentication, I don't think is, uh, was ever incorporated, right? So, um, you know, uh, there, there's uh, some data integrity, checksums and, and whatnot to make sure that data is coming through appropriately. But, but not security, they're not meant for security. Right, yeah, so this is the challenge. And, and you, we talked about different ways that attackers can get in. Um, I think that we're starting to see, you know, uh, many of these criminal groups identifying that this is low hanging fruit. Um, we, you know, we have uh, numerous examples just in the last year of people coming in and attacking hospitals, uh, Ellie, as you were describing earlier, a totally uh, unfathomable thing in the middle of a pandemic that's affecting all of mankind. 
Um, I, I really hope that we string his, those people up when we catch them. But, um, you know, coming in and attacking these hospitals, not necessarily through the IT infrastructure, but also through uh, OT access vectors coming in through equipment and attacking, you know, critical subsystems um, within some of the complex uh, pieces of equipment that are deployed. Um, so that's, you know, obviously th this is really near and dear to my heart. As you mentioned, Josh, it goes back to, uh, you know, our early career days. Yeah, you know, fundamentally, I, I think that the security posture and operational technology is something that needs to be addressed and, uh, you know, something that everybody should be concerned about, as we mentioned, you know, security in depth and, uh, and some of these other concepts about, you know, low-hanging fruit, path of least resistance. Right? Yeah, I mean, speaking of path of least resistance, one of the things that, honestly, I find so interesting about the IT, OT, cybersecurity space is that on the IT side, we're seeing attackers willing to shut down critical operations for like very crucial aspects of like stuff that underpins modern society. And they're going through, you know, some pretty high hurdles in some cases to get ransomware running on some of these IT systems. I mean, if you look at a modern Windows machine, it's actually pretty difficult to like subvert that at a, at a very deep level. I mean, I think these days, if you can get a full jailbreak of an, IO, of a, of an iPhone running iOS with all the patches, I think people will pay like $2 million for that, for that exploit chain. You know, I mean, these are, these are not like low hanging fruit, but yet we're still seeing ransomware attacks against these systems. And what you, you, you two described, Ellie and Mike, about OT systems is that there's no security on these things. They're just like, they've, they, they were built, you know, in some cases a decade or two ago, there's digital components on them, but they were, they were made for reliability in the physical world rather than for, for cybersecurity against a witting smart adversary that's trying to subvert this stuff. I mean, I could, the GAO report says as much about DOD weapon systems, uh, but I could imagine a scenario where rather than us talking about Omnitrax getting its IT infrastructure hacked, we were talking about, hey, like all of Omnitrax's fleet is being held ransom because somebody got on there and wiped all the firmware from on all the on the, on the engine control units um, and and the locomotives are just giant uh, pieces of metal sitting in the rail yard, you know. Or if it's a hospital context, rather than you talking about uh, the IT systems for scheduling patients and things, you're talking about the actual physical equipment, like an MRI machine, or imagine if an MRI machine goes down in a hospital or God forbid, like the, the robotic surgery equipment in, in, a, in, um, in a surgery suite, like it could get really bad, right? I mean, I, I don't know that we've seen any of that reporting in, in the news. Why do you think that is? Is it just that hackers haven't really gotten their hands on this equipment? Is it that it's just easier to do the IT cybersecurity thing? Do you think it's just a matter of time? Josh, I got a couple of theories on that. So first and foremost is that I think that the the, the landscape has changed, as you mentioned. Uh, IT uh, you know, security has made significant improvements and advances in, in recent years. Um, you know, We've talked a couple of times about operating system security evolving tremendously the last couple of years. I think that the... Uh, I think that the community of mal actors is starting to appreciate um, what operational technology uh, presents to them to, you know, when they're attempting to achieve their nefarious goals. And I'm happy that the InfoSec community is also uh, you know, pivoting attention. Uh, before the pandemic at Black Hat and, uh, Def and at Con. DEFCON, right, there was an aviation cybersecurity village. Yep. There was uh, the a ICS. lot more talks. Yeah, the ICS Village, Bryson Bort runs every year. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and so, you know, as a percentage of talks, we've seen uh, an increase in that over the last couple of years, but it's it's relatively new and recent. My theory is that we're going to see a lot more of this. Um, I mean, we're already seeing some indications of this in news reports, but, you know, when the bar is on the, on the floor and it gets really tough to come in, you know, the front door using uh, tried and true methods, as Ellie was describing, you know, people are, are going to do that end run. Um, so, you know, it terrifies me thinking of uh, a railroad's fleet, you know, being hacked uh, from the asset perspective. Um, and yet I think that that's where uh, investment needs to be made because um, I, I don't think that the industry um, has positioned uh, technology appropriately to 
defend against that, to alert on those types of conditions. And so obviously that's something that, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about how we can contribute to that problem. Um, you know, speaking to, uh, you know, how we address it though, it, it will take a industry-wide solution, but if we can take any lessons learned from what IT attacks look like, uh, unfortunately, I think just because of the regulatory environment um, and the way that, um, you know, cybersecurity has evolved as a global, uh, you know, legal, uh, you know, theory, uh, the operators at the end of the day are the ones that um, will be responsible for defending their assets because they're the ones with the liability. And just I, like in the IT side, right? Right. Yeah. Nobody, you know, as I think success, I, I'm not aware of anybody that successfully sued a major software vendor or hardware yeah. vendor. Well, Sony did firewall was happening. Right. Yeah. Sony wasn't able to sue Microsoft because all of their machines got crypto lockered when the, um, you know, the, the North Koreans attacked them. Right. Right. But, you know, even if, even if there was a mechanism to recover damages and that might be an interesting, uh, you know, conversation for the public to engage in, um, at, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, it's the operators, it's the users of the equipment, um, you know, that have to suffer the consequences until, you know, things are back in place. So, you know, it, it's my life goal, my, pro, you know, professional aspiration, of course, <laughs> along with you, Josh and Ellie to, to make sure that that is never the case. But, uh, but certainly that's, that's my top concern. Um, just looking at this, you know, net, net macro level in trends. I was going to say, I, I totally agree with Mike. Like, I feel like it's just a matter of time. And I think if you're kind of comparing to the IT world, then like now we were talking about like Sony didn't sue Microsoft, but also the service providers are providing like secure by default instances and are like, they are kind of building those things in so that smaller companies that might not have resources to, to do all of this um, can, but I think it's like an extra interesting problem in the OT space because there's a lot of legacy systems. And I think that like, not only are those a little bit tougher to upgrade, you know, you can't just like replace a thousand windmills or whatever, you know, like it's just a lot harder, but I think there's also a level of hesitation, right? Like people know, I'm, I'm thinking maybe about the medical side of things. I'm not like a medical device expert, but I can imagine this kind of like anxiety on, on their end. Like, no, we, we design these to work and they work and they have to work and they do. So like, what do you mean you're going to add things to them or like change them? That's scary. Right. So I think it's just right. kind of a, a whole different bear. I think that that's a huge, uh, you know, difference when we're looking at securing OT spaces is, is recognize that this massive investment exists in equipment that's out in the world and that has uh, in many cases, much longer service life potential and expectations than anything that we see in the IT space. Yep. So the, the right answer is not to life cycle all of this stuff. That's inefficient uh, on so many different levels. I think that the right answer is to figure out how do we apply you know, the best practices and, and learnings from, uh, from you know, 20 plus years of InfoSec and IT, and then adapt that and, uh, you know, tailor technology to the OT domain and into the specific protocols and technologies and use cases and implications there um, and, and uh, retrofit things. Uh, you know, something that we've learned uh, recently working with the rail industry is that, you know, locomotives will be repowered. They'll actually uh, take all the panels off, they'll lift the engine out, they'll put a new one in, they'll make some upgrades to, uh, to the electronic system. And then uh, they'll put the panels back off and send it back out. A, a locomotive, if it's repowered, might have a, you know, the chassis might be in service for 40, maybe even 50 years, which is just wild. So, yeah, you know, compare electronic... that to a cell phone, right? Where oh, you've got yeah. two or three years or a server, maybe six years. Can't wait for my new one, right? And yeah. I, I just bought one like two years ago. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not uncommon in operational technology environments to see control systems that are in place and expected to operate for you know, 15, 20 plus years. But you know, what's changed of course, is that now we're all operating in what the DOD calls a contested cyber environment. And, uh, and I don't think that there's any debate about the need for companies to uh, you know, continue to apply technology and use data um, as a competitive advantage, just if nothing else, um, not necessarily to, uh, to um, you know, get ahead of the pack, although certainly forward leaning companies are doing that, but just to keep up. Um, it's just not an option to, uh, you know, to stay analog, if you will. So, right. uh, 
tough, right. tough, uh, tough market and um, presents unique challenges. I think it's, I think it's a different conversation. I, I totally agree. And I mean, so I, I like the idea of taking the lessons we've learned from IT and applying them smartly to OT, right? And I think maybe some listeners who never thought about the possibility that their non-IT technology might get hacked and held ransom uh, would be thinking, okay, well, what's the analogy here? How do, how do people on the IT side defense, like, defend against ransomware? Ellie, what are some of the techniques that you've seen? I mean, we talked about defense in depth, so maybe there are, there's a whole chain of these things, but what are the, some of the things that you've seen successfully employed to thwart ransomware attacks? I think there are a lot of things that you can do. Um, Mike was talking about like the different ways to pivot through a network and just some of the more like advanced capabilities. I think if it had to be boiled down to the top two things, like two actionable things, um, the first would be offline backups, like just make sure that you're kind of doing regular backups of your systems and then storing those offline or disconnected from your network, right? So that in case you do get some malware that is trying to crypto lock your, your system, it hopefully won't be able to also um, affect your backups. And then you can, you can kind of restore from there. Um, the other thing is phishing. Like that, that's one of the biggest avenues for people to download malware or get infected with malware. So I think just kind of the basic cyber hygiene and like knowing what to look out for and, and like not clicking on, on links that you don't know, um, asking questions, like if something doesn't seem right, ask a question, right? Don't just kind of go with it and like download this file if it doesn't seem quite right. Uh, so I think those are, are the two kind of top things. Offline backups to make sure you can restore just in case you do get affected. And then just kind of being aware on the cyber hygiene side of things to kind of get the low hanging fruit to not get infected with the malware in the first place. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And Mike, what are some of the things on the OT side that are corollary cyber hygiene uh, type things that we should be doing but aren't? Yeah, so I think it starts with configuration management. So understanding and having real-time, um, you know, real-time view or intelligence on what's deployed in your operating environment um, within your, uh, your assets in your operating environment, understanding what the subsystems are, the hardware, software, and firmware that is, uh, you know, that, that's currently there. And then, um, you know, the gold star goes to the, the companies and entities that have the ability to, um, you know, continually monitor and understand and identify changes in that environment. Uh, it, it's interesting, you know, cyber attacks against OT uh, really kind of take you back to an earlier day of cybersecurity because it, it, often we're talking about lower powered processors. Um, you know, uh, there's a lot of microcontrollers. Um, so there's a lot of firmware deployed, um, you know, in these environments. Being able to uh, just detect, hey, wait a second, there was a, uh, there was an update that was made to this particular controller. The CRC, you know, doesn't match. That really fundamentally is like the best thing that you can do from a detection perspective today. And, um, and it's just amazing how, uh, you know, as an industry, those kinds of capabilities haven't been extended to operators. I think that's just a fundamental detection method. Um, you know, it, it is akin to training your workforce not to click on crazy emails offering you a free lottery ticket. Although um, that's still relevant, right? Because people are plugging those maintenance systems onto the OT side. And as and, we talked about, pivoting is one of the classic ways that you you get to where you want to go. Yeah. And, and to that point, you know, the the you know, I think that we've placed um, as a community a lot of uh, uh, faith or or trust in this concept of an air gap. Um, I fundamentally do not believe in air gaps. Um, you know, I, I think that there are- Especially given ex some of your experience in the military. I, there's just no such thing as an air gap. Every okay. system needs to interact eventually with another system. Um, if it's not going to be uh, through an on-net connection or some type of, you know, uh, some type of network connection that exposes you to the out outside world, there's going to be maintenance activities. There's going to be hardware failures and things are going to come in and out. Um, there are going to be people bringing equipment into proximity with, uh, you know, nearby systems. There are going to um, be floppy disks that get plugged into your Boeing 747. There are always floppy disks. Uh, oh my gosh. So, 
Absolutely. Um, I, I just, I fundamentally don't believe in the air gap. I think that that's been disproven by the community, but we continue to hear professionals, you know, uh, uh, you know, crutch on that. And I think that the reason is because as a, as an industry, um, there in some cases are no alternatives to just air gapping a, a system and just making sure that it's kind of working and not having any introspection. So, you know, having the ability to do data acquisition, having the ability to do configuration management, um, having the ability to do basic, um, you know, on the line or message line monitoring, uh, I think are the fundamental uh, hygiene components in OT. It's like step zero is like visibility, right? Like I've, you alluded to it at the beginning, Mike, but like you got to start with where you're at, you know, and that will at least give you kind of a springboarding point to decide what to do next. Yeah. And I mean, one of the advantages is because all of these systems are completely unsecured, it's relatively easy to get monitoring equipment in place to just shovel all of this data back and integrate it into some of whatever you've got going on in your SOC, right? So it, it, it may seem like a really difficult challenge, but there are definitely like folks hard at work trying to solve some of these things, I think. Some might call that a silver lining. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. The thing that makes you vulnerable is also the thing that allows you to protect it, right? Um, so I wanted to close out, there was a really interesting article that came out in the Wall Street Journal uh, in, uh, back in, I think it was in December, um, in their Future of Everything cybersecurity section. It was called The Hacker's Eye, Their Next Targets from Schools to Cars. Uh, and they listed a whole bunch of stuff in here, including locomotives, aircraft, um, and, and, and other kind of IoT devices. Uh, where do you think we're going to see attacks going in the next three years? And what do you think the first thing is that's going to get going to get attacked? I think personally, kind of the power grid is is always top of mind to me, um, just because that is fundamental to so many other systems. And I think that, like, I don't know, we've talked about pivoting. We've talked about how like things are getting connected that haven't been connected in the past, and like we just need visibility into systems we haven't had visibility into. And I think that all of these things are going to converge on something that could be really dangerous. And the power grid is just one of those things that scares me. So I personally believe that, uh, so first off, phenomenal article, uh, shout out to the writers at, at Wall Street Journal for pulling this together. Um, they listed a ton of different categories, some of which I think have already been routinely compromised, like cell phones, um, I don't want to say cars have been routinely compromised, but I, I do believe that cars, uh, as they be, as they continue to become, um, you know, interconnected, are are going to present an absolute massive, uh, you know, uh, threat and magnet, you know, to um, to people who would wish to do bad. I think the things that I'm most uh, concerned about are, or, or that I think are we're going to see more of, are attacks against. Uh, companies um, looking at that, that use industrial equipment. I think that, um, you know, companies that are doing manufacturing production um, that have control systems, whether those are serial based, um, you know, uh, IT based or, or ethernet based, I, I think that, I think that the next wave of attacks is really going to focus on those. Um, in particular, there are certain industries that use control systems that where there's been a lot of vertical integration and there are relatively few suppliers and it's those markets that I think have the most to be concerned about. Um, there's a lot of safety I think found in the diversity of a supplier market base because an attacker uh, you know would have to uh, you know custom build and invest in capabilities um, and would have to conduct a lot of intelligence to figure out what a particular factory has deployed right? But there are other markets in the commercial and industrial space where there are only two, three suppliers of the control systems. And there, I think that's where we're going to see um, you know, significant issues. So um, hope to get ahead of all of it. Uh, I know that there are a lot of people leaning into the problem, um, but it, it still uh, it, it strikes me as, as a, a problem. Yep. I think so. Well, we'll see who's right. Hopefully, um, hopefully we never see a cyber attack against any of these things, but I, I doubt that that's the case. Uh, Mike, Ellie, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a real pleasure and I hope to have you on again very soon. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Thanks, Josh. Thank you for listening to this episode of Planes, Trains, and Tanks. If you enjoyed this episode, 
please consider leaving us a review. To learn more about Shift 5 and our products, visit our website at shift5.io or follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter.